the human is denied every day to hundreds of millions of people. Dans ce temple des Nations Unies, nous sommes les gardiens d'un idéal. Nous sommes les gardiens d'une conscience, la lourde responsabilité. Et l'immense honneur qui sont les nôtres doivent nous conduire à donner la priorité au désarmé dans la paix. Chaque génération, sans doute, se croit vouée à refaire le monde. La mienne sait pourtant qu'elle ne le refera pas. Mais sa tâche est peut-être plus grande. Elle consiste à empêcher que le monde se défasse. Se défasse. Okay, I think we can start and I'm really glad to welcome you all back to the second session of this afternoon of our second day of the Masterclass Global Actors for Peace Beyond the West and the Rest. And I'm really glad to welcome Professor Mauro Bussani uh, for being with us this afternoon. And uh, of course, as you know, also later for the double interview with Anne Peters, who we had the pleasure of listening this morning. Allow me to, uh, um, to say a couple of introductory words to Professor Mauro Bussani. Mauro Bussani is Professor of Comparative Law at the University of Trieste. He's a John Professor at the University of Macau and member of the faculty of the Catholica Global School of Law in Lisbon. He received an honoris causa doctorate from the University of Freiburg in November 2019 for the great contribution that this research and this work gave to the development of legal sciences, especially in the areas of comparative European and global law. And these areas of interest, these areas of research are indeed broad and rich. It focuses inter alia on comparative law of contracts, towards European private law and legal harmonization. And in this sense, I want to remember the great contribution of Professor Bussani to the project, the common core of European private law that over the years also evolved and grew in the common core of European administrative law who received the very prestigious ERC grant of the European Commission a few years ago. Both of them are Cambridge University Press and Oxford University Press series that Professor Bussani co-direct. Uh, but also law and development, human rights, comparative law, uh, global law. So it's in particular in this vest that we are particularly uh, grateful for uh, hosting him today. And when you think about a global scholar, probably you have in mind uh, something similar, someone similar to Mauro Bussani. Mauro Bussani has been visiting professor in the US, in Canada, Brazil, France, Switzerland, UK, Portugal, Serbia, Hungary, Israel, China, member of numerous institutes, uh, uh, part of the board of numerous journals like the American Journal of Comparative Law. He author and co-author 30 books and more than 160 essays. But he's also one of those professors that can change the life of his students. And this uh, has been my personal experience with Mauro Bussani. He's the kind of professor that tells you go, learn a language, take a flight, go to do an Erasmus in France. And probably if I am here at the Lille Catholic University, going back in time, uh, probably there is a, a good suggestion of Mauro. So it's with a particular gratitude and happiness that I welcome him at our masterclass for a very interesting lecture about globalization of the rule of law, Mission Impossible. We will try to understand why. Mauro, you have the floor and thanks again for being with us and with our students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina, for this uh, overly lovely, overly generous and uh, to some extent moving introduction. Thank you. And thank you uh, to the organizers of this uh, intriguing and fascinating masterclass and uh, to the Faculté de Droit de l'Université Catholique de Lille. Uh, je vois que parmi les organisateurs, il y a aussi Sonia Le Gulliek et le doyen Ioannis Panoussis, auquel j'ai étant mes remerciements. Yes, Mission Impossible, the globalization of the rule of law. Um, let me start with a 
reminding how deep differences across legal traditions and cultures have uh, uh, never hindered the West's effort to export its own law, or as some might put it, to reform the law of the others in order to make them to, to make them uniform with or compliant with that of the West. These efforts are ongoing, often blurred by the rhetorical veil of so-called legal globalization. Now, the focus of this presentation is on the attitudes and methods underpinning uh, um, Western attempts uh, to transplant outside the West, not just single rules or institutions, but one of the main um, pillar of Western civilization, i.e. the rule of law. It's worth noting at the outset that by West, I will refer to the areas of the world where Western legal tradition is the backbone of the society. And by Western legal tradition, I mean that which a handful of world societies have in common. That's to say, in the words of the great John Merriman, I quote, a set of deeply rooted, historically conditioned attitudes about the nature of law about the role of law in the society and the polity, about the proper organization and operation of a legal system, and about the way law is or should be made, applied, studied, perfected, and taught. End of quote. We will see that the Western set of deeply rooted historically conditioned attitude in the words of John Merriman is perceived by our mainstream legal culture as a set of attitudes deprived, bereft of adverbs and adjectives and therefore as a toolkit that should be ready to be transplanted into any other legal tradition and into the mind of any other lawmakers and law users. From these premises, I um, will first put forward a series of cultural and practical caveats arising from a comparative law understanding of the legal changes pursued by Westerners outside the West. Second, I will sketch out uh, uh, the overall attitude taken by the West in promoting legal change around the world with a focus on the role scholars have in supporting this process. Mm. I will then direct the analysis to the rule of law itself. This bacon of Western civilization will be reappraised in this presentation from a comparative law point of view, in order to buff on earth um, its uh, intimate legal foundations and to scrutinize its potential to be transplanted outside Western societies. The final part of the presentation will show how, or will try to show how, such transplant initiatives can only be success successful through a radical shift in the, from the usual way the West approaches the legal settings it aims to change. Now, caveats. Lessons learned from both the past and the present show us how often Western endeavors uh, uh, targeting the trans transformation of the law of the others did lack and still lack the support of a comparative law toolkit in order to meet the basic, basic needs 
of contextualization for the solutions to be applied outside the West, outside the West. I think this is out of any question in the sense that it, there's no serious doubt about it. But in assessing these initiatives, these initiatives aiming to transplant legal West outside uh, the West, one should keep the various possible level of analysis differentiated. The evaluation of the cultural aspects is one thing. The evaluation of operational, practical, practical aspects is another. On the cultural level, those who engage with the, lesson, uh, the lessons of history teach us how one of the most evident phenomena of of the suppression of suppression of legal diversity, that is colonization, first determined the propagation of European models within the colonies. Then a halting, stumbling effectiveness in their implementation. And finally provoked a critical reaction to their forced dissemination. Although not, not, although not necessarily to the whole contents of the transplanted laws. But another and more general cultural critique against forced destruction of legal diversity stems from a simple evaluation of opportunities brought by the evolution of the legal solutions. The fewer the types of solutions av available, the fewer the possibilities that depending on the changing needs, new models could be tested, spread or imitated, which is, which is precisely what occurred many times within our own Western history. I mean the imitation the picking up of bad, better solutions from abroad, even narrowing the inquiry to the domain of private law, it would suffice to think of the very idea of equity, the Anglo-American equity taken from canon law, the uniform commercial code notion and role of good faith taken from German law of obligations, legal outlines of negotiable, negotiable instruments taken from medieval Italian law, rules of the institutions of business law applied worldwide, first taken from the Italy-born Lex Mercatoria or law merchant, and nowadays from the Anglo-American legal framework. And the examples could be, could multiply. We could go on for, for hours. Being that said on the cultural level, I promised or I said that there's a, the cultural level has to be kept differentiated from the operational, from the practical level. And on the operative level, efforts to impose legal uniformity call for a different appraisal. It's indeed necessary to recognize that not every divergence from Western paradigms is to be blindly praised. For instance, some um, divergences may be the output of a legal tradition that actually is oppressive to a portion of society. Think of ge female genital mutilation or Think of the overall role of woman in, the, in certain societies. In turn, some cultural legacies can be very costly to keep in place in light of economic development aimed, I'm not, talk, I'm not talking of a Western, necessarily of a Western 
path of economic development. I'm talking uh, in, in light of uh, economic development aimed at overcoming survival patterns. In, from this perspective, suffice it to refer, I think, to how unofficial system of dispute adjudication may fail to provide effective access to justice to the poor or to those who are marginalized within the community where the unofficial dispute uh, adjudication system takes place. Or one can think of how legal paradigms for distributing land and other entitlements according to a religious or clannish values may dramatically limit incentives to go beyond mere subsistence models. I, one can think of incentives to innovation, entrepreneurialism, capital accumulation, investments. Further, I think one may appreciate how, I, I think it's necessary to appreciate how process of legal uniformation can uh, take place without any driving force external to the concerned polity or the concerned community of society. These processes can be carried out through the spontaneous acceptance of the same body of rules by different groups, by, by different groups of law users able to effectively enforce widespread transnational compliance with no imposition from above or from outside. Lex Mercatoria, law merchant, the rules controlling the transnational diamond trade, as well as much of, much of transnational international financial law are amidst the many, I think, good examples in this respect. No imposition from above, from outside the common acceptance of a widespread body of rules. But a final caveat is in order. It's well known that most debates about and ground initiatives aimed at a Western style legal globalization are prompted by geopolitical and uh, micro or macro public and private economic interests. It's equally true, however, that the same discussions would likely take place in our societies, even without the tracking of those interests. One must indeed acknowledge that what is in inherent, co-essential to any civilization is a phenomenon anthropologists call expansive ethnocentrism. That is the tendency to consider one's own form of society better than any other and trying to spread it as much as possible. From the perspective of this presentation of my analysis, the aforesaid assumptions would run as follows. A, in the West, the rule of law is considered to be a valu valuable asset in and of itself and B, it is unavoidable for the West to promote its vision of the world and to widely disseminate the rule of law institutions to be shared with the rest of mankind in order to improve the political, social, economic, and cultural lives of the others. Now, the pursuit of uh, expansive ethnocentrism and of Western interests can, be then, can then be seen as noble or necessary, but to avoid sounding awkward or tragic, 
I think that above caveats and uh, analysis to come, the following analysis need to be taken into account. First of all, the foregoing observations should lead one to stress that when the aim is to successfully transplant at one's own rules or institutions into another context, one must always be aware of the needs to be met, as well as of the tools that are better attuned to the recipient's context. Needs and tools are factors that change considerably depending on the area of the law and on the region of the world one targets. Excuse me. What is necessary to make a, the most simple examples to what is necessary to make a, uh, any procedural law reform uh, effective can be, it actually is quite different for France and Burundi. Uh, at the same time, l l l on the same food, labor law is not intellectual property law. Movable assets are different from immovable assets. Finance is not commerce and so forth and so forth. Moreover, the possible lack of a common cultural background shared by lawmakers and law takers and the neglect of the essential involvement of the local law users may actually turn any transplantation process into, wishful, into wishful thinking or make its implementation exceedingly costly, economically, politically, and socially in terms of time, money, and energy. But keeping in mind above remarks may also help us to deal more sensibly with a more general and forceful drive towards the so-called globalization of the law. Now, along with uh, economic globalization, legal globalization has long been supported by a large part of Western public, of the Western um, uh, public discourse. Uh, by Western political, intellectual, economic, and professional elites. Of course, there have always <laughs> existed different approaches to this legal globalization, but they seem much more related to the issue of leadership. The United States, the EU, the common law, the civil law, much more related to this issue of leadership rather than to the scale of values they promote. This is why the global models keep being forged, shaped by Western or Western trained legal professionals, mirroring the tenets of Western law and largely reflecting the interests of the Western world. It's worth mentioning at this point that among the proponents, uh, the apostles of Western legal theocracy or Western legal patterns, a crucial role has been and is performed by legal scholars. Scholars are indeed powerful agents of legal change and of legal transplant. It is not always, uh, it's a role that is not always um, acknowledged and or underlined. Actually is largely overrated and one could say poor cause. Why? Because in addition to uh, advising governments and agencies, legal scholars participate in transnational public debates and therefore may influence foreign legal circles, debates and public opinions. They are not perceived by legal communities, by local communi 
legal, uh, local legal communities, and by local communities at large, as they're not perceived as agents of uh, <clears throat> external imposition. And as such, they do not trigger resistance. In principle, at least, the scholars simply want to spread their knowledge and their worldviews. But whenever their arguments prove, prove persuasive, they may, may penetrate local scholarly debates. And the solutions promoted as a consequence of these arguments can eventually be adopted in foreign settings via the mediation of the local legal elites with no need to exert any economic, political, or military pressure. No need. So next to economic power, scholars certainly represent one of the most effective channels through which Western legal notions and models have progressively entered the vocabulary and informed the techniques ordinarily used in international legal debates and in the international and transnational practice of the law. This is nothing new, one could say. It's often held, it's, it is often held that one of the driving forces of legal globalization, that's to say international law and its technocracy, is a field where the rules that are debated and promoted usually show a strong correlation with the interests of their proponents. And uh, I don't know if this kind of thing that I'm saying would please our friend Anne Peters, but we will talk to, with her later on. And from the perspective I just mentioned, it will suffice here to recall an old Western example, by no means an isolated one. The illustration is well known to international, scholar, uh, international law scholars, but it can be particularly useful and telling to the students because it involves two famous international law scholars actually considered among, amidst the, the, the founders of international law. Two international law, famous international law scholars who when faced with the same legal issue arrived at different solutions because they were serving different national and professional interests. <clears throat> it was on the occasion of a legal dispute at a time when the Netherlands depended on the maritime commerce and had to face the formidable competition of Spain and Portugal that one of the founders of modern international law, Hugo Grotius, or the Groot, while giving advice to his country for value, wrote the famous book Mare Liberum, 1609. In this book, he came to the conclusion that the freedom of the seas was a principle of natural law. So the Dutch fleet could not be hindered by any kind of claim coming from Spain or Portugal. Some decades later, when England started to affirm its maritime hegemony, another famous ju jurist, considered uh, one of the founders of the modern international law, the Englishman this time, John Selden, was called by King James I to plead the case of the English over the North Sea and the North Atlantic against the Dutch. At that point, and to serve his, his professional interest and of course his king, John Selden deemed it uh, uh, scientifically unavoidable to defend the, the thesis opposite to that of Gratius in the equally famous 
Mare Clausum, who was, which was written in, take it, pay attention to this, was written in 1635. So the English, it, uh, 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 in John Selden's view, in John Selden uh, scholarly view, so to speak, the English could not, the English fleet could not, uh, uh, the English uh, um, sea could not be invaded by the Dutch because there was no natural law principle of uh, open sea. What, what the, the natural principle, the natural law principle was the opposite. Everyone owns its own sea. I try to take your, draw your attention to the fact that the book was published in, in Latin, lingua franca at that time, uh, still at that time, in 1635. Uh, the first English edition of the book was published in 1652, 70, 17 years later. But only one year after Cromwell's Navigation Act, which had limited commercial traffic with England to the English fleet only. So in this respect, there's nothing new, as I said. But what is new in current Western endeavors to change the laws of the rest? And here the role of legal scholars has been decisive, is that these endeavors are not limited to the dissemination of rules. These efforts are more or, or less consciously Excuse me. Underpinned by the idea of penetrating the other's frames of mind, of penetrating the categories that shape legal problems and priorities even before any legal solution may arrive. The aim is to, uh, to have all these compliant with the Western legal Weltanschauung with the, and with the Western uh, legal agenda, with the Western view of what law is, with the Western view of how the law works and how it, it, the law needs to be thought thought, taught, and applied. By and large, these endeavors represent an, at an attempt to globalize uh, the very axis of our uh, civilization. That is to universalize the legal notions, principles, and rhetoric that are at the foundation of our Western society. And the most telling example that will help, hopefully, uh, to understand the, these efforts to westernize the world and how they are carried out come precisely from the debates on and the use made of the rule of law. There is no doubt, in fact, that rule of law is a key notion to understand not only Western legal lingo, but also the ethnocentric discourse clustered around the very notion, that very notion, as well as any possible arguments circulating about the expansion of Western law, its reasons, its aims, its patterns. But what is the rule of law? Many authoritative definitions of these notions are in circulation. Many. Setting the tone for the mainstream discourse. Now,
for the purposes of this um, presentation and to avoid the cherry picking, let me refer to some definitions whose authority is uncontested and that you should have at your disposal, that the students have uh, at their disposal. For example, an off-cited report by the UN Secretary General reads for the students at parag uh, paragraph six, I quote, the rule of law is a concept at the very heart of the UN organization's mission. It refers to the principle of governance to which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. It requires, as well, measures to ensure adherence to the principles of supremacy of law, equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation in decision-making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, and procedural and legal transparency, end of quote. The Council of Europe, of which 47 states from across Europe, including Russia and Turkey, are members, undertook a close analysis of the rule of law uh, across many legal traditions. And in its uh, 2011 uh, report on the rule of law, the European Commission for Democracy Through Law, known as the Venice Commission, that is the Council of Europe's advisory body on constitutional matters, discerned and singled out the following fundamental uh, elements of the rule of law that the students find at the paragraph uh, 41 of the paper I circulated. I quote the Council of Europe. Legality, including a transparent, accountable, and democratic process for enacting law, legal certainty, prohibition of arbitrariness, access to justice before independent and impartial courts, including judicial review of administrative acts, respect for human rights and non discrimination and equality before the law, end of quote. Now, many other authoritative no uh, notions of uh, rule of law could be traced in the wake or at the origin of the de two definitions I've just uh, reminded you of. But what is worth noting right away is a paradox. As everybody knows, some of the features that we just mentioned attached to the rule of law cannot be found or not fully fledged in all Western societies. And at the same time, some of those features think, for example, of accountability to the law, public, publicly promulgated laws, obedience to the law, the guidance role of the law can be found in many non-Western societies, including Islamic and autocratic societies which Westerners do not consider to live by the rule of law itself. Incidentally, incidentally, just incidentally, let me remind you that the modern Arabic translation uh, of rule of law is Ziadar al kanun meaning the sovereignty of law. Further, 
one could uh, remember, as some pointed out, not many, but some, that the 1936 Soviet constitution provided for judicial independence and the supremacy of law, equal rights, free speech, free press, and a whole host of other liberal democratic ideals. Now, in order to diffuse the threatening impact of these paradoxes, the threatening impact of these paradoxes on the mainstream definitions and on mainstream public and scholarly discourse, two discrete arguments have been advanced. First, to reject or scrutinize the membership of autocratic and Islamic societies in the rule of law club must include respect for human rights in the core definition of rule of law. This perspective too, however, calls for some refinement. Indeed, there would be a bulk of refinements to be brought into the fore. Today, let me focus only on what follows. There is a wide array of rights, civil, political, economic, social, cultural, collective, that are celebrated by the public discourse as human rights and might therefore be considered as candidates for the inclusion in the definition of the rule of law. Are they all to be included? Look, if the answer is in the negative, no, 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 not all these rights can be included in the core definition of human, of, 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 of um, rule of law. If the answer is the negative, one should make it clear not only which human rights Westerners and the whole of the non-Western world can accept as a part of the core definition of the rule of law. Not only, but not only which human rights can be included, should, shall be included, should be included in the core definition of the rule of law, but also one should make clear who decides which human rights may or may not be part of the core definition. If the answer is instead in the affirmative, yes, all, 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 all civil rights, uh, civil, political, economic, social, cultural, collective rights are to be included in the core definition of the rule of law. What should conclude that the rule of law can be fully recognized only where the whole range of human rights, including the social and economic ones, are actually enforced. Otherwise, to say the very least, whichever rule of law definition may, wherever, either raise the selection issues mentioned above, well, which woman rights will decide what, or, excluding most often the costly social rights, end up making little or no sense for the poor, for the destitute, for the disadvantaged, thereby breaching even the equality before the law, which, as we know, is the fundamental and ubiquitous promise of the human rights discourse. So, every all, every and all, and each and all human rights are to be included in the, in the rule of law. So at, at, at that point, we, we end up excluding many Western countries from, from the club of the rule of law abiders. Because economic and social uh, I'm not speaking now, I'm not talking about of civil rights, but certainly of economic and social rights. And these economic and social rights are not acknowledged and actually enforced everywhere in the West. So 
wherever they are not um, acknowledged them, properly acknowledged and enforced, we should speak of a society, of a, of a jurisdiction where the rule of law, even if it's a Western country, is not the lodestar of the system. If not, every engaged human rights is to be included in the notion of rule of law, one should make it clear which rights and who decides which rights are to be included. Tricky questions. As I said, to diffuse the paradoxes um, that uh, I mentioned, there's a second line of argument, which is connected to the first one and yet different. The second line of argument focuses on the idea that the existence of the rule of law is a matter of degree. With all legal systems being on a spectrum with no rule of law at, uh, at, uh, at all at one end and a complete actualization of the rule of law at the other. Thereby, ending uh, up speaking of the rule of law as, I quote, an ideal, but an ideal worth striving for in the interest of good government and peace at home and in the world at large, end of quote. The quote is from Tom Bingham, a famous uh, British scholar whose work was the inspiration behind the approaches to the rule of law taken by the UN and by the Council of Europe. Now, this argument, straddling pragmatism and messianism and celebrating this would be a, a, a different uh, seminar in its own, celebrating the transition ideology as if uh, every society would be in, in transition, every society which is not a Western one would be in transition from where they are to the Western heaven is a sort of a biblical uh, view of the world. We, the elected people, and the other nation. But leaving all these aside, these arguments straddle pragmatism, messianism, and uh, may be taken as a generic ideas to be deployed uh, uh, in political discourse or, but with nothing to do with a, a serious legal analysis, or can they be taken as an implicit acknowledgement of what has long been clear to historical and comparative law scholarship? That's to say that the dynamism of legal and social and political and economic phenomena may in the long run accommodate multiple stop and go process, as well as allow for a deep change in the legal and social and political and economic cultures themselves. In other terms, that's what's, what's new. Comparative lawyers and historians have never, as, as, have always acknowledged that in the long run, not uh, as a, not, not as a matter of um, one or two or, or few generations, but in, in the long, long run, there can be, besides stop and go processes, also a, a way of converging of some civilizations, of some cultures towards some common points, towards a, com a common frame of reference, a common cultural frame of reference can be. It has happened in the past, through different mechanisms, all of which took a long, 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 extremely long period of time, speaking of centuries, it can be. So what? In other terms, what I want to say is that we are before an argument that either hinges on a messianic idealism or aims at, for 
what for legal historians and comparative law scholars so simply is uh, reinventing the wheel. But for our purposes, the point is that even the reinvention of the wheel, the reinvention of the wheel line of reasoning relies A, on an argument usually deprived on the historical comparative reservoir of knowledge that could help better understand the reasons and the back and forth of the ongoing processes. And therefore relies, relies B, on a logic that ends up underpinning the short-termism, short-termism of Western legal transparency into the rest, precisely as we have <coughs> no, <coughs> excuse me, precisely as we have known them, the transplants so far. But this is not all. The variable degree of uh, awareness, sometimes of opportunism, brought by the participants in the debate on rule of law, is further, further <coughs> proved, further evidenced by a survey of the public discourse and scholarly discussions about the functions to be assigned to the rule of law. <coughs> going, going excuse me, going uh, over a really wide ranging literature, one can see the rule of law spearheaded to defend the social and human rights, oppressed minorities and democracy, whatever it means, as well as to strengthen the judiciary market-friendly legislative reforms and guarantees uh, for, for, for uh, uh, foreign investments, thereby meaning especially the protection of property, uh, private property and contractual rights. So, a social rule of law, the rule of law is used uh, the functions assigned to rule of law can be social or business, put it roughly. But it's, what is notable is that following one or the other of the above direction, one can be led to very different assessment, very different assessment. According to the producers of uh, global legal indicators, such as World Justice Project or the World Bank. The so-called uh, autocratic or dictatorial, even dictatorial regimes can rank very high in terms of foreign investment of, uh, or other business, while score, scoring poorly in terms of social rights protection. For example, Colombia under Alvaro Uribe rule, which is usually reproached uh, as an example of lack of respect for human rights, by the global business indicators was praised as being governed by the rule of law because it guaranteed economic investments in many sectors. And the same happens now for China. In the Doing Business uh, report, uh, as you know, by the World Bank, in the Doing Business report 2020, the legal systems of Singapore and the United Arab Emirates are ranked respectively second and 16th out of 190 countries as being business friendly. While in the Freedom of the World Report 2019, they get respectively a score of 50 and 17 out of 100, 
for their limited protection of political rights, civil liberties, and freedoms. Conversely, in some European continental countries, such as Italy, France, Germany, one can find severe legal limitations to the sanctity of contracts and of property, property rights. No, no doubt, the reference goes easily, for example, to the pervasive judicial review of contractual terms, to employers' responsibility for providing health and retirement coverage for their employees, and employees responsi employers' responsibility for complying with strong laws regulating uh, layoff practices the statutory limits on foreclosures in mortgage law, the mandatory intervention of highly professionalized notaries in certifying legal transactions. So these countries may thus be considered less performing with regard to the role of business law, and yet be seen as promoting a redistribution of entitlements that better guarantee, guarantees a higher level of participation in democratic procedures lower barrier to access to natural and primary sources, resources, and more intention, and more intense, I'm sorry, protection of so-called social human rights, such as the right to work, fair pay, education, health, and social security. I don't know if you follow me, but there's a, there's a divide that is not often acknowledged in the use of rule of law. Some, of course, did acknowledge it and did explore this divide. But the mainstream discourse keeps on sticking to rule of law as a all-encompassing uh, notion, when by contrast, the notion is much more complex and multifaceted than then the mainstream discourse is ready to acknowledge. Another example of, of, uh, of uh, functional uh, mismatching could follow. But now, once reminded the low degree of specificity and or of realism, achieved by the mainstream definitions. Once reminded the blurring reference to human rights requirement, as well as the perfunctory allusion to the dynamism of legal experience, I think you all could, if not would, agree that the question we started from keeps recurring. What is the rule of law? What is the rule of law that Westerners are so proud of to the point of wanting to promote it and transplant it everywhere else. As we have seen, the expression rule of law tends to refer to the whole of our legal civilization. Uh, I, I just need, suffice it to recall it, but I need to recall one of the two definitions that I, that I quoted before. Uh, and if I take the UN report, you know that the re rule of law is, is to be found in that, quote, all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights norms and standards. And, and, and the rule of law consists also in the supremacy of law, the equality before the law, accountability to the law, fairness in the application of the law, separation of powers, participation, in the decision-making, legal certainty, avoidance of arbitrariness, procedural and legal transparency. Now, what, are, what of our overarching legal architecture is left out from the language of this definition? Which of the foundational pillars of our legal culture is missing? Nothing. All is in. Now, 
to be sure, this attitude could be seen as embodying a, politici a politician-friendly linguistic convention, as many others, as innovation, sustainability, this kind of thing. Abstract, vague, superficial notion. But even in this perspective of a politician-friendly linguistic convention, it would be quite unfortunate under both the normative and the analytical point of view. In normative terms, the point is that this oversized notion of the rule of law would ridicule, sorry for this, my, my pronunciation of the English was a bit leaning on the French, uh, uh, it's a ridicule, no. Uh, the point is the oversized notion of the rule would ridicule from the very outset any serious discussion of the possibility of having it translated outside the West. If we have the rule of law is all of our civilization, we cannot think seriously of transplanting it uh, uh, outside the West in less than 1,000 years, unless we supply history with a made in West accelerator. In analytical terms, a rule of law as equa is equated with entire legal civilization would confuse the rule of law with the whole of our legal te techno structure and, and makes it indistinguishable from the other features of our legal system. Thus, what? We could either discard the notion as an unwieldy linguistic convention devoid of any analytical or normative meaning, or we should try to understand whether there exists a core notion, a core notion of the rule of law that can describe our legal experience and that can be seen as the germ of our legal accomplishments, whatever they may be. But does this notion, this core notion exist? And in, 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 if yes, where and when was this core notion generated? It's a common opinion, excuse me, that rule of law as we understand it, was first coined in England with the 1215 Magna Carta, or some centuries later when the famous uh, judge Edward Coke forbade King James I to sit in his court because he, the judge considered the king lacking the technical knowledge uh, that is required to uh, administer the law. Now, these were paramount events that marked a point in time and space in the development of Western law's efforts to constrain the power of the sovereign. But in order to understand what the rule of law is, one should bear in mind that the law stands in bio-univocal bio correspondence in an osmotic connection with the culture the law stems from and the culture the law contributes to generating. And one should consider the Western culture and law were not born in England. Thus, to the very same purpose, one should go further from focusing on the appointment of or, excuse me, apportionment of powers between the sovereign and its subjects and on the Magna Carta and its time, and the, and its time there, sh there would be, there could be a, a lot to say, but one should certainly go farther than, than this, uh, uh, than focusing on this episode. And one should go deeper 
when understanding what made possible the, technico the technocratic uh, uprising of Judge Coke before King James I. Indeed, in a broader historical comparative perspective, the seed of the rule of law can be found in an organize, 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 uh, I'm sorry, organizational model that was born in Roman law. When, when, when in the presence of, a, of an increasing articulation and complexification of society, it gave way to the secularization of the law giving process. I'll try to make it clear. When one looks at the deepest roots of the notion of the rule of law, or that's to say, when one looks for the essential ingredient or whatever the recipe of the rule of law is, it can be seen as a social legal institution, whereby the power of deciding conflicts that arise within a society is assigned to an independent secular lawyer. More precisely, in this model, the public figure who is legitimized to settle dispute is the jurist, is the a technocrat, on the basis of her, her specialized notions, and not, and not a popular lay assembly, as in the Greek democracies or elsewhere, nor a figure provided with religious wisdom either philosophical, moral, or traditional, such as the Islamic Qadi, or the African chief of the community, or the delegate of the political party, as in the socialist legality. It's a technocrat, a jurist, which, who settles disputes on the basis of her technical knowledge, or her specialized, secure, secular, independent knowledge. This is the core of the rule of law. This is a feature that surfaces, to be sure, in many of the mainstream definitions referred, that I referred to previously. It is usually presented as independent adjudication, as in the UN uh, document, or uh, as an access to uh, justice before independent and impartial courts, as in the Council of Europe document. But the role of this element is decentralized by the parallel emphasis on a long list of attributes, all deemed crucial and substantial to the very notion of the rule of law. And yet, without the independent secular dispute, secular dispute resolving technocracy, none of the features of the rule of law, the, the, those very definitions emphasize from supremacy of law to accountability to the law to a prohibition of arbitrariness and judicial review of administrative law, whatever. None of these uh, features would have been able to find their way into the development of Western institutions. Without the independent, secular, dispute resolving technocracy, any defense of one's own entitlements any claim against fellow citizens, any claim against public bodies, including claims related to the implementation of principle of equality, non-discrimination, and to the different forms of freedom, would be, and outside the West, can, they can always be prejudged against a set of political, religious, philosophical, clannish values, goals, and rules. Values, goals, and rules that, that do not represent the backbone of our legal and institutional infrastructure. But, but, but conferring the power of resolving disputes on an independent technocratic professional requires a secularized society. That's to say a, so, a society uh, in which we find a social and cultural context that deeply supports the independence of the dispute settler from religious as well as from political transcendentalism. A society in which individuals and groups have led their ruler 
or the other customary or religious chiefs to dismiss the power of resolving disputes arising in the society itself. Dismiss this power. This is why, <coughs> excuse me, the Western way of looking at and thinking of and applying the law did not take root in societies which arranged their development according to different institutional engineering, according to social beliefs, political legal balances that are at odds with the primary role to be assigned to the independent secular dispute resolving technocracy. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong, uh, uh, the, uh, all what I, said, uh, what I said is by no means to be understood as overlooking that something far more complex than the implementation of the both core of the rule of law as I single it out on Western soil has allowed us to follow the path toward the construction of the set of notions and principles as well as of techno structures capable of supporting the development of legal institutions that organize our society today. To the contrary, my point is that one should be enlightened, enlightened by this historical path. Being aware of this multifaceted historical track would prevent one from synchronically flattening it down and squeezing it into a definition of a rule of law that simply masters together everything Western societies have so far achieved. Packaging the bulk of Western legal civilization and labeling it uh, uh, as a, a, a rule of law to use it for export purposes and in the political discourse as if it were a commodity or a turnkey plant reveals itself as not only faltering faltering on the ground, but also heedless of and ungrateful towards our own history, a history which only with great efforts and conflicts and bloody wars has passed down the complex of tools that are now available to us and that we would like to see adopted overnight everywhere. Indeed, all the conception of the rule of law circulating in our debates come from, are entrenched in, and aim to reflect the whole of current political and institutional Western frameworks, as well as the role and work of legal thought producers and of lawyers, judges, and law enforcement agencies. What is it evident, what is further evident in this overpatching packaging uh, of the rule of law is that the formulas it contains and the proposals it makes leave aside any historical and comparative analysis able to overcome the partiality embedded in the regional dimension of Western legal culture. In other terms, that intellectual, what I want to say is that the intellectual awareness as well as this scientific attitude necessary to understand the impact of our views on experiences different from ours are totally missing. Let me be clear also, all this with, uh, I, I would have no objection, all this would be reasonable if we were to discuss the rule of law and its living features in an all Western dimension. And if mainstreamers, so to speak, frame their work in terms of Western rule of law or American rule of law or European rule of law. No, but this is not the case. The inclination, the implicit assumption to, that this should go universal, the inclination towards universality, timelessness or both is always there, is always out there. But depriving the rule of law of its very historic and comparative value or assessing it through the lens, lenses of a handful of indicators, as we have seen, makes the export version of the rule of law, be it supported by big money 
by states, by NGOs or global institutions, become one of the many spongy, spongy notions, which either serve the interests of those who use them or offer a vision of the law and of the world that lacks the capacity of, to look beyond the West, towards the rest, which is reminded to us also by the brochure of this wonderful masterclass. Consequently, any claim about treating the Western rule of law notion as the one, uh, as one that includes the whole of Western legal civilization and that can be universalized without paying due attention to its historical sources and to the different contexts where it is or it sh should be exported is simply doomed to appear as preposterous or opportunistic. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that th those notions of rule of law turn to in a, into a high historical, high geographical concept, concept without history, without geography, are put in the service not of the gradualism evoked in some of the theoretical approaches, but of strategies unable to build a pacified and fruitful relationship ship between us and them, uh, between the Western, Westerners and the rest. Our pub public discourse fuels the belief that the other lacks the rule of law, not as the starting point of an analysis willing to be inclusive of diversity and of a shared perspective, but as a defect, as a flow to be set straight or condemned. Almost like saying that not only is the West the Lord of the rule of law, but that the West should also be the Lord of any law. Along the way, they contextualize and naturalize. The rule of law ends up either representing the foolish servant of Western opportunism or feeding autarkic visions of the world, ill equipped to understand, never mind solve any problems of the others. In conclusion, assessing, if not plainly promoting Western style, uh, Western style rule of law requires a full-fledged understanding of, uh, its, uh, of the variety of, the, of historical, economic, and cultural background against which the different legal system flourish, systems flourish, converge, diverge, compete with, and imitate each other. It's high time, I think, we met the need for the globalize, the globalizing our views on the role and a role and scope of our rules and institutions. These view are the product of culture and the civilization whose history and actual development are not fully shared by the rest of the world. If, if, and I stress 1,000 times the conjunction, if we are willing to persuade others that our own way of dealing with the law is better than everyone else. We can no longer treat our history and its law as commodities or equity funds that can be placed every, a, a, anywhere. Westerners should, uh, should hone and rethink their methods, attitudes, and programs, whether they aim to impose, advise, or simply prod legal change. Western initiatives should be brought forward with a view that should be inclusive of Western as well as non-Western rationales, those coming from their respective legal traditions from current legal frameworks, ours and theirs. How can we claim to understand other civilization, cultures and legal system or to have better rules than they do without knowing what they do have or where, or where our own and their rules come from? This is a major question that in another, not only a seminar course of its own, but in order to assess the quality, so to speak, of other legal systems, may we possibly rely on GDP? Uh, in French is uh, produit intérieur brut, c'est PIB, GDP, gross domestic product. Is any French speaking able to, to help me? Is it? 
is it like that? Okay. Uh, but my, in order to assess the quality of other legal systems, may we possibly rely on GDP or on the foreign investment index or, or some surveys focusing on the sentiment of local English speaking citizens? The search should be instead for criteria that are able to calibrate our judgments and our options on the variable standards that other legal experiences offer rather than on the measure of self-established and self-serving messianic spirits. The latter uh, remark appear all the more, uh, the latter um, attitude of self-serving and self-established messianic spirits through which look at the word, uh, the rest of the word, appear all the more unhelpful and even dysfunctionally absurd when they stem from an unquestioning reliance on the econometrics of international financial institutions or on the knowledge of one only, usually one's own. One only and usually one's own legal system. Thus, thus the final point is that any serious analysis of whether and how to spread the rule of law must tap into reservoirs of knowledge different from those utilitarian and simplified toolkits that we have exploited so far. What theory and practice need is to absorb the lessons of anthropology, history, and comparative law. These are not mere academic disciplines or sort of intellectual exercise devoid of actual impact on the making and the processing of legal rules. To the contrary, to the contrary, these fields of study are the most powerful heuristic tools to able to drive the analysis towards solutions which promise to be working because of being in principle at least, unfettered by Western centered biases and because they are inclusive of what matters in the local settings. These are reservoirs of knowledge that represent an indispensable instrument uh, in, to try the facts, sort out the problems and possibly find appropriate solutions to the given times and context. Abandoning, abandoning these reservoirs of knowledge gives way to alternative approaches. The ones we have uh, surveyed so far. Alternative approaches which, especially those embedded in the indiscriminate and grandiloquent discourse on the rule of law, we have seen appearing innocently or, or otherwise, consciously or not, as simple exercise in rhetoric, sometimes opportunistic, sometimes commendable, sometimes useless, and as it happens, sometimes bloody. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this insightful uh, uh, overview about all the contradictions that there are into such an apparently innocent concept, a universal concept as the one of the rule of law and to bring us to the dark side of the moon. And um, I, we have several questions, so I'm happy that we have some time to, to go through them. The first uh, are from our students of the Master Human Rights, Security and Development. So I would give, I would collect it uh, two by two, okay, Mauro? So I would give immediately the floor to Marguerite and then Oriane. And we have also some questions from the uh, audience that I will be glad to read uh, after. Please, Marguerite. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I think. Perfect. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you so much for this very complete discussion on the rule of law. I was wondering, uh, on, in order to spread the rule of law, I was wondering about the role, uh, the stance, if any, of the civil society in the globalization of the rule of law on a question. Thank you. Do you, you speak, thank you very much for your question, but do you think of uh, civil societies in Western countries or on the outside the West? Outside the West, sorry, I, I should have made it uh, that clear. All right, yeah, all right. I, I think that- uh, I the, collect two, uh, we collect two, so that okay. we, okay. Uh, uh, Yes, can you hear me? Sure. Okay, so first of all, I would like to join Marguerite in uh, her thanks for this interesting conference. And as you said earlier, Western societies are not uh, able to fully respect and apply some features attached to the rule of law, while some states uh, seen as non-compliant with the rule of law ideal uh, 
actually abide them, such as the Islamic states. So I was wondering if you think that the rule of law should be considered as an obligation of means and not an obligation of result in order to qualify a state as a democracy, thus allowing the states to adapt the principle of the rule of law to its cultural and social uh, specificities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. May I now reply to Marguerite? I, I missed I missed the name of the second lady, Oriana. Yes, yes. Oriana. All right, thank you. Uh, speaking of civil society, you know, the, the, this is another catchword. In the uh, in the sense that. What is civil society in, uh, I don't know, in a, in, in, in a non-Western uh, uh, setting? Civil society, if you mean that the whole of the society is um, in favor of a Western style uh, rule of law, uh, the problem has already been solved in the sense that in a short run, there will be a government that will implement the uh, Western style rule of law. If, as I suppose, think of civil societies in terms of a sort of avant-garde uh, uh, of students or intellectuals uh, uh, that uh, try to gather together and to attract the interest of the concerned society around the development of a new form of governance, of new form of uh, political uh, architecture for their own country, we should be extremely uh, careful in, a, in, a, in the understanding. I mean, I'm, I don't take political sides, of course, in this. Uh, setting in this conference, but who are we speaking to? We Westerners, to members of civil society who speak uh, English, usually French, sometimes Spanish, Italian, German, right? Who speak Western languages, who usually are educated in the West or have been following a Western lead, a Western path in, uh, uh, in looking at the things of the world. Don't get me wrong, I'm a Westerner, so I'm in principle in favor of anything that is Western-like, okay? But, but this does not prevent me from understanding that there are different kinds of civilizations, different kinds of cultures that have their own uh, development, devel development, that they have their own historically conditioned and uh, development phase. You see, if we could, we could uh, enlarge our, our, our viewpoint, uh, in different direction, from the Arab Springs to the Hong Kong protests, uh, to the Pakistani lo lawyers' uh, uprise, to many, many other settings. It depends. Civil society is a notion, but but sticking back to your to your question, civil society is a notion that has to be uh, uh, understood in a more granular way. But, uh, as I said, from a quantitative point of view, if you speak of all the society, this means that all the society is ready to uh, uh, adopt a different uh, governance model, a different uh, political uh, architecture, a different legal framework. If you speak of avant-garde, it depends how these avant-garde are related to the rest of the culture of the country, uh, the rest of the grassroots popula population. Uh, you understand me? Uh, is it clear to you, Marguerite? Can you understand me? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, no, no, because I mean, you know, the media 
frequently uh, speak of civil society, the Arab Spring or in Pakistan, as I said, the, uh, Hong Kong. Have you spoken to any Chinese only speaking uh, Hong Kongese? Uh, not, I mean, not you, you as an, you in, in a Latin um, uh, formula, you as, a, as everybody. In the media, in the media, we, we, we read about Hong Kong only what reported to uh, Western media by English speakers, mm -hmm. residents in Hong Kong. Okay. Have you ever been to Hong Kong? Marguerite? No. If you go over there, you, you find millions of people who look Chinese, of course, but this is, uh, does not, has nothing to do with uh, our discourse, uh, who speak only Chinese. And there are people, I, I left Hong Kong one day before one of the riots in the, in um, in November, uh, in November nineteen, of course, uh, the, the the last fall in which we were free to uh, rove again, uh, rove around the world, and uh, and I spoke with a lot of people uh, in who, who spoke English, of course, and even that, even they were very skeptical about this kind of riots, this kind of protest. Sh underlining what? Underlining that Hong Kong has been Chinese for 5,000 years and has been British for uh, six less than six generations, 150 years more, 150, 160 years. So the legal, the culture, not they would not speak. We're not, we're not talking law. Whether the culture, the language, the attitudes, the beliefs, even the religious uh, beliefs, were all coming from the Chinese uh, cultural tradition, Chinese civilization, and they found uh, exaggerate or absurd. It depends on the on the point of view of my of, of the people I was, I was speaking to, but. There were different adjectives defining uh, a position contrary to the protesters. And these were Hong Kong residents. And let me add to this, they were educated people, not uneducated people, all right? So, I mean, civil society is a, is a notion that as it's, um, a powerful heuristic uh, uh, value uh, in a sociological terms and in understanding the phenomena, provided that we are able to single out the nature, the, the, the dimension and the nature of the civil society we're talking about. Uh, um, I don't know if I, Yes, you did. Thank you. Close to give you a reasonable answer. Uh, I, I like very much uh, uh, the private law language of uh, Madame uh, Oriane, which whom I cannot see any longer. Oh, yes, I'm here. Obligation de moyens, obligation de résultats. C'est quelque chose bien familial à quelqu'un qui a étudié droit des obligations. And uh, yeah, uh, it's, um, uh, the, the answer comes from a, a piece of, um, of, uh, of uh, my presentation that was uh, probably hidden in the discourse. Some, some say that uh, rule of law is a matter of degree. The, the ones who say that the rule of law is a matter of degree speak the language of obligation de moyens. Ah, uh, we cannot guarantee the result, but we do our best, okay? All right, but in scientific, in legal terms, outside the law of obligations, what does it mean? What, what 
even, I mean, Xi Jinping, the president of, uh, the chairman of uh, PRC, the People's Republic of China, could answer to you or whoever uh, posed the question in these terms, precisely in terms of obligation de moyen. Ah, I'm doing my best. Considering my history, uh, considering Chinese civilization, considering degree of uh, development, of uh, human and economic development, considering the demographic, considering the number of people who live in, uh, in my country, I'm doing much more than the best to reach what you Westerners call rule of law, right? I, it, could do, it could say so. Because obligation de moyen, even in the, in, the, in the private law discourse, can mean a lot of things. And the fault or the responsibility which arises from uh, the lack of, of complying or fulfilling the obligation de moyen is something that fluctuates according to the kind of obligation to the sector of the law obligation, to the type of contract, to the respective role of the parties within the contract, and blah, blah, and blah, 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 blah. So Xi Jinping would say, could make the, the, same, the same kind of differentiations, the differences and refinements to any question, any, any, any answer to this question. So that's why I don't, I, I don't buy the, uh, the, the notion of a rule of law as a matter of degree. Unless, as I said, as I try to make clear, make clear that we acknowledge that in the long run, in five or six centuries, uh, other societies which are different from ours, which are not abiding by the rule of law, will come closer to us, will converge. It, it is possible, but it is possible at the same time, if we take an, uh, an historical, uh, uh, an history mindful approach that we can change for the worst. We West can become something even more uh, far away than we actually, than it, that we currently are from a full implementation of the rule of law. I'm not saying that what happened a few days ago at Washington DC in the United States is the flashing, it is the flagging alarm of something that happens all over the West, but certainly is coupled with a lot of phenomena which take place in France, in Italy, in Germany, in, in the UK, in Spain, in Holland, uh, in, I'm sorry, in Poland, in Hungary, and many parts of the so-called Western world. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a signal that things may change. Actually, things always change. It depends on the direction and maybe the direction this time can be the other way around. I don't know if I was able to answer your yes. question. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I would collect the last four questions, apologizing in advance um, with those, since we have just 15 minutes, I think is the, the best we can do, but I would encourage uh, the last uh, um, participants in the discussion to keep in mind the questions because we will have time uh, after the break during the double interview also uh, for some questions from the audience. I would give immediately the floor to Camille and then Trevor. Uh, hello, Professor, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Yes. So thank you again for being with, uh, with us this afternoon. So from what I understand, one of the issues of the globalization of the rule of law is that despite efforts, it cannot be successfully transplanted in a uniform manner all around the world. Um, so what do you think could be effective guidelines to achieve more inclusiveness and adaptation to non-Western states in which the rule of law could be transplanted? Or on the contrary, do you simply think that it should not be transplanted at all. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, ah, okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you again for being here. Uh, so my question is more about when you were talking about measuring the rule of law through different factors like uh, the economy or the respective human rights. And I know that you don't necessarily subscribe to defining the rule of law this way or measuring it like this. But I thought it was interesting um, considering, especially in this COVID time, when we can think about non-Western countries who might be scoring a little better economically or respecting human rights, notably with the right to health, rather than some other Western countries. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. And excuse me, Trevor, the question is? Um, whether the, the rule of law and measuring it through like, in, in non-Western countries through economic or respecting human rights factors that previously haven't necessarily been very prominent, but now in the COVID era are becoming more, you know, they're respecting it, they seem to be respecting it a little bit more. Okay. Please, Melvin. Oh, I, I thought that you said four questions. There are, two. There are four in total, but I think we can. Oh, ah, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, I have a shorter question to Trevor and a bit longer to Camille. I start with the shorter. I don't know if uh, <clears throat> I. I don't know if um, Trevor, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear uh, you. All right. All right. Yeah. I don't know if they are respect the, the, the non-Western countries are respecting more now than in the recent past due to the COVID crisis, uh, the rule of law. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've, I've no data uh, reliable on, on it. Uh, you, if you, as you, if you, as you did, speak uh, of uh, uh, right to health. Uh, I think that many non-Western countries have performed apparently quite well uh, due to a chain of command <laughs> much more effective than in many other, than in many Western countries. And uh, something that I like to, to underline in this uh, regard is something that surfaced on the New York Times only a couple of days ago while was acknowledged by Asian uh, media, at least uh, as from uh, mid-December. I'm referring to the fact that China is, uh, uh, has been donating hundreds of millions of uh, Chinese vaccine to African countries for free. Of course, the, we know that all the philosophical and sociological debates about gifts. Gifts are never gifts in and all itself. They always per pursue an advantage that can be economic or social or personal or egotistic or psychological, whatever. But the truth keeps being that China um, distributed and, don uh, and donated hundreds of millions of vaccines in Africa. Why we Westerners, why we Europeans, EU, members, I don't know if you are a, uh, a, a British uh, red, uh, citizen, so no longer a EU uh, citizen or not, but the EU debated uh, the, how many those uh, Germany bought, how many those in, uh, arrived in France, in Italy, blah, blah, all, and, you, and the usual self-serving uh, and self-looking uh, and self-mirroring uh, discourse, while China peacefully and uh, with no a great, no, not, not a great advertisement, um, uh, try to contribute to the uh, implementation of the right to the health outside its borders, serving uh, hundreds of millions of vaccines into Africa. So this is my unsatisfactory answer to your very intriguing question on which I think we do not have, or at least I don't have uh, enough, uh, a critical mass of reliable data on which found any kind of reasonable and sensible answer. Coming to uh, Camille, I, uh, uh, I, I stress many times that uh, the conjunction if, 
if we want to transplant anything. I don't know if the history of the West has to be always uh, uh, signed by this uh, ex uh, et expansive ethnocentrism or this kind of uh, colonialism in disguise as we have uh, practiced uh, in the last 70 years. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I think that uh, the, and I wrote about that, I, I think that we should concentrate our own efforts and the worldwide attention, attentions to, uh, on, on, on some basic needs and basic freedoms, basic needs and basic freedoms that are not decided by Camille, by Mauro, by Trevor, by Valentina. No, that have to be decided in a, in a global conference, UN driven or whomever driven, uh, that try to, uh, that should try to uh, set up and reach an agreement on some basic needs, some basic ideas, some basic uh, freedoms, some basic rights. And, and if there is a global agreement or a quasi-global agreement, this should be enforced through global and regional courts, not domestic courts. I, I understand that this kind of um, problem is a, a very sophisticated problem. And I thank you again for this kind of question. But what I wanna say is that we cannot think of, uh, if I stress it for the acting time, if we think that we should export some of our key legal notions, we should find a, a global, uh, we should try to reach a global agreement. It cannot come from our own preferences, our own decisions, which are very seldom innocent, very seldom uh, naive. They are, they've always been driven by some kind of uh, opportunism, even when, even when, even when uh, the, uh, the operator on the, operators on the, in the field were absolutely uh, innocent and, and, uh, and pure, so to speak. Think of um, thousands, 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 thousands people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, actually engaged in human rights operations through their own, through, the, through NGOs all over the world. These are sort of, uh, can be seen as sort of martyrs to use a Christian vocabulary or to saints, okay? Because they devoted uh, energies, even their lives to a good cause to what appeared to them and what appears to us as a good cause. But if we take a step back and above and try to understand in what kind of cultural framework the human rights discourse was born, why? How has it been uh, promoted, in which directions, enjoying what, what, what kind of funds, from who. And we find, on the top of this, we find that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents of the State Department of the US and of USAID, the agency which is, uh, which is in the hands of the the go uh, governmental agency of the uh, United States, which is in the hand of the State Department. 
where, where it's clear that it's written clear. You don't need to interpret that, 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 that language, that free market, democracy, rule of law, and human rights are crucial to the pursuit of United States foreign policy and to uh, strengthen the uh, economic and political interests of the United States. You, you start with putting all the bricks in the same wall giving the wall a shape that you can agree with or you can disagree with, that you can explore better, but, or simply take it as it is. But I mean, um, you see, I mean, there, uh, uh, at the bottom line, there's, uh, the, there are the lives and energies and physical and mental efforts of hundreds of thousand people striving and fighting for, uh, a human rights implementation around the world. And behind them, there's a, a, a linguistic, cultural coine, coine, I mean, a ba common basis that makes the Westerner, the West, the beacon of the world. Who knows why? Because we have more money. Is it enough? Is it enough? That's why. I referred even cursor, even though cursorily to the GDP, to the to the richesse de la nation. What has to do with what is good, what is bad for human lives? What has to do with human lives is a basic level of uh, survivance. What has to do is the meeting of the basic needs, no doubt. And that's why I said a few minutes ago, I'm sorry, Valentina, if I've been longer than expected, but just to, that's why I said a few minutes ago that if we want to uh, export, to transplant uh, outside the West, our values of our rules and institutions, we should not go as we did in the last uh, two centuries, but try to understand what are the basic needs that are uh, shared as a primary primary necessity from all over the world by all over by all over the world and try to reach an agreement on this but once the agreement once the agreement reached has to be enforced because i think all decent people uh should be tired of cosmetic uh, dec declarations by UN, EU, US, uh, uh, whatever, whatever in the, uh, international agency and, uh, and uh, in the, um, international institutions about the need of providing aid to this, that, what, and then, then what happens? Well, there are figures at your disposal as, as they are at my disposal, showing uh, the amount of um, money spent in technical assistance. And please go and look to whom they, they, this money has arrived and to hate to the populations and look at the results. I mean, uh, I'm done with this kind of co co cosmetic, uh, declarations. I want a court which is able to review all the um, uh, deeds and operations that have been, uh, that will be carried on in fulfillment of the promises of guaranteeing the satisfaction of basic needs and basic freedom. I don't want to leave this review to domestic courts that can be tilted one way or another by domestic uh, political power. But I finish the, all this in the framework um, oh, um, controlled by the big if with which I started this response to you, this answer to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mauro. Um, if you agree, I mean, uh, I would 
perhaps ask five minutes of your time since we already announced the last two questions uh, that are from Baptiste. Baptiste is pursuing a master's degree in public international law at Montreal University. And this degree dissertation is focusing on rule of law implementation during the transitional justice process. Uh, Baptiste is asking, do you think that by defining the rule of law with a more formal conceptions, it has to not referring to the substance of the law and good governance and thus excluding the consideration of human rights in its definition, we can consider exporting a universal means of ensuring that individuals can define their future without imposing on them governance marked by Western traits that could, as you say, clash with the realities of cultures. You mean, uh, you, do, do you mean, do you want me uh, to respond right now? I will, I will tell you also Mohamed. Mohamed is that uh, it's uh, uh, second year students of Bachelor in International Relations at the European School of Political and Social Sciences, ESPOL, originally from Malaysia, but studied in France uh, since one year and a half. And Mohamed asked, do you think that the rule of law itself is a Western understanding of the law? Uh, to Mohammed, my, 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 my answer is, is short and clear. Yes, I absolutely agree with you, with you Mohammed. And uh, for, for many, many reasons, uh, um, uh, the, um, finding out, the, the finding, finding out uh, if you want to find out the, the reason for which I, I fully agree with you, it, it, it suffices uh, opening a, a, a serious uh, history of uh, East Asia or, uh, or Africa uh, or South America to understand um, why you are fully and completely right. As to Baptiste, <laughs> He is evoking a, a kind of, a, uh, he, he's not, you're reading this because they are not connected, they're, they're video connected, they're only chatting. The problem with the micro, yes. For right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, he's evoking a, a kind of a, 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 a line of argument that I carefully avoided in, in my presentation. Uh, he's well aware of the distinction between thin and thick notion of rule of laws, uh, between uh, substantial and procedural uh, or formal and material rule of law, dichotomies who have, uh, uh, who have uh, a huge role in the academic uh, role game, but have, uh, in my opinion, very little to do with the reality. So uh, with the reality in, in the real world, I mean, uh, the real world that, that we, scholars, uh, jurists, uh, have the duty to understand before formulating any uh, good or bad idea that we are able of. So I don't buy the, 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 the divide um, uh, on which Baptiste uh, uh, grounded it. He's, uh, he's, 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 he's a he, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a question. And uh, so um, I think, I simply think that uh, what, what I said that at the core of our notion of rule of law, there is a, uh, uh, the, not only the existence of a secular, independent, technocratic uh, dispute uh, solver, but also as I said, the perception in that society that he has to adjudicate disputes according to his secular, specialistic, professional, technocratic knowledge and not according to political power, religious transcendent transcendentalism uh, or any kind of uh, Power, other powerful uh, inspirations different from uh, the law. Of course, I'm not naive at the point of thinking that judges in France, in Italy, in Germany, in Spain, UK, not to mention United States, are sort of uh, uh, 
virgin technocrats without political ideas, without political leanings. No, 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 no. There's no virginity in the law, never been. Uh, but what I, I say is that if I want to um, uh, favor Valentina, in a, I'm a judge, and Valentina is a, is a, is a climate in, in, in a trial. Uh, supposing that I'm not, I, I'm not recusing myself because I cannot recuse myself. And I have to adjudicate the disputes in which uh, Valentina is involved. Whatever I think is that I, I have to write down a decision grounded on rules, on legal rules, on legal notions, on interpretation of legal rules. I cannot speak in terms of, of politics. I cannot speak in terms of uh, religion. I cannot speak in terms of uh, friendship with Valentina or enmity with, uh, 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 with another person. No, I have to uh, uh, argue, uh, to ground uh, my arguments on technical reasons. And this is a huge difference. Because I, 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 to make it, to make a long story short, outside the West, the, outside the West, there are always two kinds of situations we can find. Or there's a, someone who adjudicates the disputes, who gives his, his or her, his, usually his, I, alas, his ruling on religious, philosophical, uh, political ground, or there are, or there are countries in which there are courts of law, but they are uh, coupled with other circuits of courts, which decide according to principles, which are religious, traditional, whatever. So only in the West, and with some exceptional and worth studying uh, uh, and already studied the exceptions regarding Sharia courts, only in the West we find, which applies by the way only to Muslims, who, have, who, did, who solve this is only among, among uh, Muslims willing to go before the Sharia courts. Only in the West we find uh, the whole of the dispute settlement, the dispute settlement system in the hands of technocrats. Elsewhere, we find different branches of what we would call judiciary, which decide disputes either on, which decide disputes on different grounds, and they are they can be the only one, the only uh, judiciary circuit uh, in the country, or they are a circuit which leaves side by side with other kind of courts that can be called courts of law in the Western term. I don't know if Baptiste will be satisfied with my uh, answer, uh, but this I think is- so, and there will be in case the possibility to continue the conversation later on. Um, it's, uh, uh, we, we finish here, I think, and I thank you very much again, Mauro Bussani, for having been with us this afternoon. We have now our break, but we will meet again, Mauro, and this time with Anne uh, at five o'clock for our double interview that I think will put in a general comparative law and international law perspectives many of the topics that we address today and I hope will be a very fruitful exchange again in this idea of uh, uh, multi-perspectivism hmm, that we try Good. to address this morning. Thank Mauro, you very thank much. You. Thank you. And see, see, you, you, see you at five, right? Five o'clock, perfect. With the, the, with the other students, I, I guess, all right. Of course, right. everyone will be there at five o'clock and I apologize again for those who can, Baptiste said thank you. So I think was uh, thank okay. You. okay. <laughs> 
Okay. And apologize with the others, but please keep in mind your questions. We will have time later on. Okay. All right. Thanks to all and see you in one in 50 minutes. Bye bye. The very right to be human is denied every day to hundreds of millions of people. In this temple of Nations Unies, we are the guardians of an ideal. Nous sommes les gardiens d'une conscience, la lourde responsabilité et l'immense honneur qui sont les nôtres doivent nous conduire à donner la priorité au désarmement dans la paix. Chaque génération, sans doute, se croit vouée à refaire le monde. La mienne sait pourtant qu'elle ne le refera pas. Mais sa tâche est peut-être plus grande. Elle consiste à empêcher que le monde se défasse.